All right, we're continuing our study in the book of Leviticus this morning. And Leviticus, the first five chapters of Leviticus, talk about five different types of sacrifices that the priests would make. And then chapters six and seven talk about more rules associated with those sacrifices. The last lesson we covered the first two chapters, and I'm hoping we'll cover chapters three through seven. So we'll be going at a little faster clip. Um, I got some feedback from the last class that I taught, and it was very constructive feedback. And the feedback that I got from some people was, boy, I really love the first half of the class. <laughs> you can guess what the you guess what the rest of the feedback was that I got. I, said, I really love the first, the first part of the class was talking about why this is important and how it affects our lives. The second part, I actually read all of chapters one and two. And uh, people were thinking, well, this is kind of weary and repetitive and, and the details are a little tough. So what I'm going to try to do, and I may not, I may not actually pull it off in, in the clutch here. What I'm going to try to do is to pick excerpts from Leviticus rather than read the entire, <laughs> entire uh, uh, text. Read, pick excerpts and summarize parts of it with the expectation that of all of you, of course, are going to be reading the, 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 the chapters on, on your own. and and checking these things out. So that, that's what I'm gonna to try to do. And also I wanna focus really, I think what we should be doing is focusing on the significance of these things and the applications of these things and not get lost in the details, which is very easy to do, particularly in Leviticus. So that's, that's, that's my objective here. We'll see how I do. Um, so the five major types of offerings that are talked about in the first five chapters of Leviticus, as we mentioned before, it's the burnt offering and the grain offering, which we talked about in, in our last time together. The third one is the peace offering, then the sin offering and the trespass offering. So we're going to look at those last three, and then we're going to look at all, all five of them together. Now, it seems to me that the the entire sacrificial system, all five different types of sacrifices, and actually there are, there are even more sacrifices that talks about like Numbers 15 and talks about the drink offering. So there, there, these are not, these aren't all, this isn't the entire sacrificial system. This is just kind of the core of it. So the entire system taken together, I believe represents the sacrifice of Christ. It's not just, so each one, there's talk, each one highlights certain aspects of Christ's sacrifice. To give you an idea, Hebrews, Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 talks about this and gives some pretty strong allusions to, to, to what I just said right there. Hebrews 8, 5, it talks about uh, how Moses was told, when you build the tabernacle and you set things up and you, you start having the, the sacrificial system, God said, you have to do everything exactly the way I said. The pattern I gave you on the mountain, the instructions I gave you, everything must be done exactly that way. Why was it so important to do it that way? Because it says in Hebrews 8, 5, that these things that we're reading about in Exodus and Leviticus were a shadow and copy of heavenly things. So that's why they had to be done exactly, because they're reflecting things of tremendous spiritual significance. And then continuing in in, uh, in Hebrews chapter nine, let's let's turn there. So just just a few comments about the whole sacrificial system. Hebrews chapter nine. So keeping in mind what I just said about everything had to be done exactly this way because it's a, a copy and a shadow of things in, in the heavenly place. Hebrews chapter nine, starting in verse eleven, says Christ, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And then down to Hebrews chapter 10 in verse one, it says, for the law, 
having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with the same sacrifices which are offered continually year by year make those who approach perfect for then would they not have ceased to be offered for the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sin but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year for it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he says, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. So that's uh, Hebrews uh, 10 verses 1 to 6, where he's quoting from Psalm 40. It's actually from the, uh, Psalm 39, following the Septuagint about the, the body you prepared for me. So this is, this is this, the whole sacrificial system was God says, I wasn't pleased with this, but but he prepared a body for, for Jesus that will be offered as the perfect and ultimate sacrifice. So prior prior time together, we talked about the burnt offering and the grain offering. Just, just quick review highlights. Burnt offering, male animal without blemish, taken from among the cattle, the sheep, the goats, or for, for those who could not afford those, you could use pigeons or doves. Uh, it will be washed, the insides of the inner parts will be washed, and then it will be burned up on the bronze altar. So there's the, the in the in the holy place, you've got the, um, you have the three things. You've got the table of showbread, you have the altar of incense before the curtain, and then you have the, the, uh, the, the lampstand. So you have those three things in, in, the, in the holy place, and then outside the tabernacle itself, the tabernacle proper, you have the, the laver, which is the, the place where the priests would wash before they went in to minister. And you have the bronze offering, which is sometimes called the offering of the burnt, the, the, uh, the, burnt, the altar of the burnt offering, the, the, the bronze altar. So, uh, so the golden altar is the altar of incense inside the tabernacle. The bronze altar is the altar where they burn up the animals on the outside. So this is the burnt offering was sacrificed there at the bronze altar and uh, the blood was sprinkled around the altar and since the entire animal was burned up I think the priest got to keep the hide of the animal but the rest of it was all burned up uh, so they, they wouldn't eat any of that then then the grain offering we talked about that and David alluded to that in the uh, communion message that we had this morning it was fine flour or grain, or it could be roasted grain, or it could be baked or fried in a pan, like a, like a bread, like a flat bread. Oil and fr frankincense were offered with it. No leaven, no honey, and it must be offered with salt. We talked about that last time. A portion of that was reserved for the priest that they could eat. And I got quite a, a number of comments about this last time because comments and questions and believe me I have a lot of questions going through Leviticus that I don't know quite what to do with but I got a, a few questions were thrown out a few comments one of them was could this also point to the Lord's Supper and I think David asked me about that afterwards the, 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 the whole idea that this is a sacred bread that is eaten by the priests and, and the idea of the oil and incense, you know, in the scriptures, oil will be the Holy Spirit, incense would be the, the you know, prayers of the saints. So it's being offered with, with prayer and with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. And particularly the statement that David pointed out to me in Leviticus chapter 2, in verse 10, <clears throat> says, but what is left of the grain offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is the most holy of the Lord's burnt offerings. So this is the this described as the most holy of the offerings is this this grain, this bread that's offered with with no yeast. And uh, that, that, that makes us think about just like the man in the, in the desert is, is tied to the, the Lord's Supper. Perhaps this this also is. I don't know, but it seems like it's a reasonable a reasonable foreshadowing as well. So it's another, another another aspect of Christ that he is the bread of life that's offered up for us that we have to eat from if we or we will or we will die. Looking at these offerings, I was left with a lot of questions. There's more about in these offerings about how it seems to me there's more about how you do the offerings in terms of clarity than what the offerings are for. So I'm, 
I'm, I'm, I'm reading this, scratching my head, thinking, okay, now what is the peace offering for? What's the difference between the sin offering and the trespass offering? I thought, forgive us our sins, forgive us our trespasses. Wasn't that, doesn't that mean the same thing? So where's the sharp line of distinction between each of these five off offerings? And I'm not sure. It, it seems a little, I mean, to me, it's a little blurry. And I, can, I could cheat by reading commentaries and, and give you the answer from the commentaries. I thought that I'm not going to do that. So I'm just, I'm just going to look at the scriptures and wrestle with the text myself. Maybe uh, take a look and see if the early Christians had any insights into this. And they really don't say very much about this at all. As far as, as far as under, I guess they felt it wasn't that important. So uh, uh, in terms of understanding what these things specifically were for in the Old Testament. So that I, so it, was, it wasn't clear to me. And, and a lot of times, a number of these offerings are given together. So it says, well, they offered a burnt offering and a peace offering, or they offered a burnt offering and a sin offering together. Or they offered, so you're offered two or three offerings are all offered at the same time for something that was going on. So, uh, so it's hard for me to draw a sharp distinction. And I'll, 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 Try to present what does seem reasonably clear to me and, and not go uh, further than that or, or take some wild guesses as to what these things might exactly be referring to. But all of them seem to be reflecting some aspect of Christ. The whole sacrificial is basically what it says in Hebrews 8, 9, 10. And as I mentioned earlier, this isn't the whole sacrificial system. There's the drink offering and the various other offerings that are, that are mentioned as well in scripture. So the, the, the Old Testament sacrificial system, there were offerings in the morning, there were offerings at night, offerings when someone was, uh, was born, there are offerings when, when, when a male child is born, there are offerings for all these different special circumstances at different feasts. So it was a, a rather complex and thorough system. So I wanna take a look at the peace offering and rather than read all of chapter three, I'm going to read, we're going to read parts of it together. And let's try to figure out what the peace offering is for. Leviticus chapter three, let's read the first five verses. I'm reading from the Orthodox Study Bible. Now, if his gift for the Lord should be a peace offering, and if he should offer it from the oxen, whether male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. Then he shall put his hands on the head of the gift and kill it at the doors of the tabernacle of testimony. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood all around the altar of the whole burnt offering. Then he shall offer from the peace offering a burnt offering to the Lord, and he shall remove its fat that covers the entrails, all the fat of the entrails, the two kidneys, and the fat on them by the flanks, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall offer these upon the wood and fire on the altar of the whole burnt offering as a burnt offering for a sweet aroma to the Lord. And then down in verse 14, let's skip down to there. It says, then he shall offer his burnt offering to the Lord. He shall remove its fat that covers the entrails, all the fat of the entrails, the two kidneys, the fat from on them by the flanks. The fatty lobes attached the liver above the kidneys, and the priest shall offer these on the altar as a burnt offering for a sweet aroma to the Lord. All the fat is the Lord's. This shall be a perpetual ordinance throughout your generations and all your dwellings. You shall eat neither fat nor blood. Um, so a few things here could be male or female, unlike the burnt offering, male or female without blemish could be from among the oxen, the lambs, or the goats. The blood is sprinkled around the altar. And in this case, the kidney and the inner fat are burnt up on the altar, but my, most of the animal isn't, okay? The most of the animal is, seems to me, is available to be eaten by the people who are offering the sacrifice. More Details are offered in chapter 7. Let's turn there. Leviticus 7. Starting in verse 11. This is the law of the sacrifice, the peace offering, which he shall offer to the Lord. If he should offer it for thanksgiving, he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving loaves of fine flour mixed with oil, unleavened cakes smeared with oil, fine flour kneaded with oil, 
Besides the unleavened loaves, he shall offer with his gifts leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offering. Then from all his gifts, he shall offer one choice portion to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who pours out the blood of the peace offering. The flesh of the sacrifice of the peace offering for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day it is offered. He shall not leave any of it until morning. Uh, now, if the sacrifice of his offering is a vow or a voluntary offering, it shall be eaten the same day. He offers his sacrifice, and on the next day, the remainder of it may also be eaten, but the remainder of the flesh the sacrifice on the third day shall be burned with fire. And then down in verse 28. Furthermore, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, He who offers the sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord shall bring his gift to the Lord from the sacrifice of his peace offering. His own hand shall offer the burnt offerings to the Lord, the lobe of the liver, and the fat upon the breast. These he shall offer his uh, to place his gifts before the Lord. Then the priest shall offer the fat on the altar, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his son's. Also the right thigh you should give to the priest as a choice portion from the sacrifices of your peace offerings. He among the sons of Aaron who offers the blood of the peace offering and the fat shall have the right thigh for his portion. For the breast from which the fat was offered and the thigh of the, portion, of the choice portions I took from the children of Israel from the sacrifices of your peace offerings and I gave them to Aaron the priest and to his sons from the children of Israel by an ordinance forever. So I'll tell you what I think this is saying here as I'm reading this. So there, the first question is, what are these peace offerings for? And he says it could be associated with Thanksgiving. So I guess you're something wonderful has happened or you're just incredibly great, grateful and you're offering this as a Thanksgiving offering to God. Uh, or it could be associated with a vow that you've made that, uh, I don't know, maybe people would say, God, if you do this for me, then I will offer a, a peace offering to you. So it's a fulfillment of a vow. So uh, those are at least two circumstances under which a peace offering can be conducted. And it sounds like uh, for the Thanksgiving offering, you eat it the same day. And for the other type of offering, maybe you could eat it and, and eat it, eat it for two days. You have it that day, the next day, but on the third day, it gets burned up, whatever's left over. And but certain portions of it were reserved for the, only for the priests, the sons of Aaron, to eat the breast, the right thigh. That that those so certain portions of it were reserved for the priests. My impression is that the people who the person or people who came to offer this peace offering that they could eat of the rest of it before it was, it was burned up so that the, the priest would get some of it, but the people who came to offer it, they were also, so it's, it's a meal that they're, that they're, that they're partaking in, not just a sacrifice, but it's also a meal. Um, that's, that's, that's how I read it. That's what it seems like to me. Now I was looking through the old Testament to find some examples of peace offerings so that I could get it some kind of a feel on when would you do something like this we'll give you an example in deuteronomy 27 this is moses gives instructions to the people before he dies about what they're going to do in the future in, uh, in deuteronomy chapter 27 starting in verse 4 so Moses says, therefore, it shall be when you cross over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones on Mount Ebal, which I commanded you today, and you shall plaster them with lime. Now there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not use an iron tool on them. You shall build with whole stones the altar of the Lord your God and offer whole burnt offerings on to the Lord your God. You shall sacrifice peace offerings there. And you shall eat and be filled and rejoice before the Lord your God. Then you shall write very plainly on these stones all the words of this law. So I guess the idea is that when God has delivered them and brought them into the promised land, the land of Canaan, Moses says when that happens, in gratitude for God, they're going to be, they're going to be setting up an altar and offering 
peace offering. So this would be, I think this is falls under the category of being thankful. This is like an offering of thanksgiving to thank God for what they did. And in, in Joshua 8 or 9, depending on, on uh, which translation you're reading from, uh, it talks about under Joshua, the people actually make this type of an offering. Verse Samuel 11, there's another account of peace offering that's given. Uh, so the peace offering, what is the significance of the peace offering in connection with Christ? Uh, the peace offering brings about reconciliation. This is, this, is, this is the nature of peace. It's reconciliation. It's reconciliation between God and man. It's reconciliation between two people or two parties that may not be getting along with each other. That's the nature of a peace offering. So in, in, in light of that, let's think about Jesus as being the offering of peace or reconciliation. Read Colossians chapter 1. Jesus was sacrificed to bring about reconciliation between God and man. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, or the things on earth or things in heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became minister. This is the picture is that the death of Jesus brought peace between God and man. And we said we need to continue. The challenge is that we are reconciled to God now through the death of Christ if we continue in faith, grounded and steadfast, unmoved from the hope that we have. So that's, that's one picture here of, of the mission of Christ of bringing peace or reconciliation between us and God. In Ephesians, this is a very popular verse in Protestant circles. I want to take a look at it from another angle. From this idea of Jesus as the reconciler or peacemaker between two groups of people who were alienated from each other in Ephesians chapter 2. So let's think about the role of Jesus in making peace and being the reconcil in the offering of reconciliation. <clears throat> in Ephesians chapter 2, let's start in verse 11. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, have abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, being built mm -hmm. on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of the spirit of God. So this is the picture here is the, the Gentiles, which are, I assume, pretty much everybody in this room, okay, uh, <laughs> with uh, maybe a, a few percentage, uh, uh, a few, few percentages of uh, uh, genetic material otherwise. Uh, most of us are Gentiles here, and he's, Paul's talking about, you people who are Gentiles, you were alienated from God. And you're alienated from God's people. But through his death, he's brought about peace and reconciliation 
to make the two that were separated by the law to make the two into one. So we are now one people, we are one body, that he's not only reconciled us to God, but he's reconciled all of us to each other, that we are now unified through his sacrifice, and that we are now fit together as one building. So this is the, the to me, that this is the unifying work, the unifying mission, the mission of peace and reconciliation of Jesus. So I want to turn now to the last two offerings, the trespass, the sin offering and the trespass offering to figure out. And one of the things I want to take a look at, what are the similarities? Why are there, why do you, why do you, why do you have a sin offering and a trespass offering? Why, why don't you just have one for sin and trespass? I mean, aren't they all kind of the same thing? Uh, well, let's take a look at Leviticus chapter four, starting in verse one. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a soul should sin involuntarily before the Lord against any of the Lord's ordinances, which ought not to be done, and does anything against them, even if he should be the anointed priest and should sin to the detriment of the people, he shall offer to the Lord for the sins he committed, a young bull without blemish from the oxen is a sin offering. He shall offer the young bull at the door of the tabernacle, the testimony before the Lord, put his hand on the young bull's head and killed the young bull before the Lord. He, then the anointed and consecrated priest shall take some of the young bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of testimony. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the holy place. Then the priest shall put some of the blood of the young bull on the horns of the altar of the incense compound before the Lord in the tabernacle of testimony and shall pour the remaining blood of the young bull at the base of the altar of whole burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of testimony. He shall take from it all the fat of the young bull as the sin offering, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat on the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached liver above the kidneys, he shall remove. As it was taken from the young bull to sacrifice the peace offering and the priest shall burn them on the altar of burnt offering. But the young bull's hide and all its flesh with its head and legs, its entrails and excrement, the whole young bull, he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn it on wood with fire where the ashes are poured out it shall be burned now if the whole congregation of israel acts involuntarily in ignorance and is hidden from the ideas of the assembly and they did something against any of the lord's commandments which should not be done and committed sins when the sin they committed becomes known and the assembly shall offer a young bull for the sin and offer it before the doors of the tabernacle of the testimony. Then the elders of the congregation put, shall, put, shall put their hands on the head of the young bull before the Lord. The young bull shall be killed before the Lord. The anointed priest shall bring some of the young bull's blood to the tabernacle of testimony. Then the priest shall dip his finger in the blood of the young bull and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the holy place. Okay. Now I just... I didn't have this in my notes, but I just remembered as I was reading this that uh, there are there's at least one place in this passage here where it says uh, in uh, in Leviticus four sixteen. This is in the Septuagint. If somebody's if somebody if, if a Christian in the first, second, or third century is reading the Old Testament, they're reading it in Greek, and and what it says here in verse sixteen, it says the anointed priest. Okay, mm -hmm. and in Greek it says when the priest the christ okay the anointed one it's the same word as christ in in the new testament so this is the, the first place in the bible where the term christ is applied to a specific person so this is even earlier than psalm than psalm 2 you know against the lord and against his christ so the so aaron is referred to as the christ of god so should it be a surprise to us when it says in Hebrews that the high priest is Christ, Christ is the high priest, it's, it's, he's referred to as the anointed one, the, the, high, the, the Christ, 
in the, in the Septuagint in, uh, in Leviticus chapter four. So little minor side point here, uh, but uh, even, even the designation of Christ is applied to, to the high priest here. Um, now, this is, it says it's for committing involuntary sins. And I'm thinking involuntary, involuntary, something I did against my will, involuntary. So I think, well, you know, does that, can that mean, how do you sin against your will? It's like somebody forced you to sin, somebody forced you to sin. And, and, and the term means, as you might guess, it, it can mean either involuntary or unknowingly. So you're not aware, you're, you're committing a sin, but for some reason, you're not aware of it at the time. That would be the idea. So th these are sins you commit, you become aware of later on. I sinned, or the whole people sinned. And so this, this is, is an offering here. And uh, the interior parts, the kidneys and some of the interior fat is burned on the altar, but the rest of the animal, really basically almost the whole animal, the, the body, the, the guts, the, the hide of the animal is all taken outside the camp and burned up there. This is totally different than any of the other offerings where the animal, you know, all, all, the, all the action of the sacrifice is taking place in the temple courtyard at, at the, the altar of incense and, and right around that. And here, most of the action is taking place outside the camp. And if you think about Hebrews chapter 13, it's obvious what the significance of that is. We'll go there in a few minutes. Uh, and also note that outside the camp, when they take this body outside the camp, they don't say, build a little portable altar here to, to offer it there. Now, when the body, like the burnt offering, was offered on the um, on the bronze altar, the altar of the burnt offering. This was like you know anybody we had a, we had a cookout at our house last night. Okay, normally I, I was old school and I, and I would use charcoal grills, and so my my wife and and my daughter for Father's Day uh, got a a gas grill, which is so much easier. I'm wondering why didn't I do this years ago, <laughs> but. A charcoal grill or a gas grill, you have a grating on the top, you've got the fire, the heat down below, and you put the meat that's going to be cooked, hopefully not a burnt offering, you know, you put that on top of the grating. So that's, you've got the grating, and then the meats, the flesh is on the top, and the fire is down below. And that's the way it was with the bronze altar. But he says, in this particular offering, you don't do it that way. You take some of the interior parts and you offer them at the bronze altar, but you take essentially the whole body of the bull out of the temple area, out of the entire encampment area, basically out of the city, okay, out of, out of the whole community. You take it to a clean place where the ashes are, and it says, and you burn it on the wood. Can anyone guess what that might be possibly referring to? This is, you don't build another altar and, and, and burn it up on the grate. No, you put it right on the wood and you burn it there. That's what you do with this particular offering. So we'll touch on that a, a little bit later. In, in Leviticus 5, so this is, the, this is the sin offering as opposed to the trespass offering. And and Leviticus 5 says, now if a soul should sin in hearing of the utterance of an oath and is a witness, whether he saw or knew of the matter, if he does not tell it, he shall bear his guilt. Or if a soul should touch any unclean thing, whether it's a carcass of an unclean animal or one torn by a wild animal, or the unclean carcasses of creeping things or unclean carcasses of cattle, or should touch human uncleanness, even by any uncleanness, which by touching it he is defiled, then he's unaware of it, but afterwards becomes aware he shall bear his guilt. <clears throat> or if a soul should swear speaking thoughtlessly with his lips to do evil or good, wherever a man may pronounce by an oath and it should escape his notice and thus he should sin in one of these things, then he shall confess his sin in that thing and he shall bring for his trespass against the Lord and for his guilt a female from the sheep, a lamb or a kid or the goats is a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him concerning the sin he committed, and it shall be remitted. 
But if he should be unable to afford the sheep, he shall bring for the sin he committed two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the Lord. One is a sin offering, the other is a whole burnt offering. He shall bring them to the priest who shall offer the first one as a sin offering. Then he shall wring off its head from the neck, but shall not divide it. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the side of the altar, but the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. So, uh, so the trespass offering seems to be similar to a sin offering. Uh, my sense of this is that there's a greater degree of guilt associated here than with the one of the involuntary sins. So, but it's a, but it's similar. Uh, less costly animals can be offered by those who are poor and can't afford it. And it says that the priest makes atonement and the sins are remitted. Now it says in Hebrews that actually the blood of goats and calves could not take away sin. So we know that the sin could not be forgiven by this animal sacrifice, but this was foreshadowing the sacrifice of Jesus by which they could be forgiven. Let's turn to Leviticus 7, a little more detail about this. Now, this is the law of the trespass offering of the ram. It is most holy. In the place where they kill the whole burnt offering, they shall kill the ram of the trespass offering before the Lord, and its blood shall be pulled out all around the base of the altar. He shall then offer from it all its fat, the fat tail, the fat that covers the entrails, and the fat above the entrails, the two kidneys, and the fat on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove. Then the priest shall offer them on the altar burnt offering to the Lord. It's a trespass offering. Every male among the priests may eat these things. It shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. The trespass offering is like the sin offering. There is one law for them both. The priest who makes atonement with it uh, shall have it. Um, so it's offered on the altar of the burnt offering. The priest can eat part of it. Now, I want to take a look, go back. So the similarities and differences between the, the sin offering and the trespass offering. Sin offering is for involuntary or unintentional sins. And uh, the trespass offering seems to be sins where greater guilt is involved. The, <clears throat> there's something very peculiar about the sin offering as the first one. As we mentioned, it's burned up outside the camp. All the other offerings take place at the burnt off altar. It's not burned up in the temple area, just, just uh, some of the inner parts are. Let's read Hebrews chapter 13. So this particular offering is really a spectacular prophecy and foreshadowing of how and where Jesus would die. as it points out at the end of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13, and verse nine, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. It is good that the heart be established by grace and not with foods which have not profited those who've been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp therefore jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate therefore let us go to him outside the camp bearing his reproach for here we have no continuing city but we seek the one to come Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Uh, so the sin offering, the offering for sins that people commit, involuntarily or that they're not aware of is atoned for by a bull that is only part of it is 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 incinerated at the altar a small part the whole body is taken out completely outside the camp and burned there and of course burning is throughout the scriptures used as a foreshadowing of suffering it talks about Peter talks about uh, that in 1 Peter chapter 1. 
We mentioned that a few weeks ago. Let's turn there again. Peter's talking about the trials the Christians are going to. He talks about fire in connection with that. First Peter 1, 6, and in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is the idea is that, there's, that the trials that we're going through are like fire. Our faith is being tested by the trials of fire. So fire is associated with suffering and trials. So the animal was taken outside the camp, burned there on the wood, suffering on the wood outside the camp. And it's saying this was because that's Jesus. When he was, after Jesus was condemned by Pilate, he proceeded to carry his cross to take the wood outside the city, outside the gate where he was, where he was crucified. Uh, the, uh, so you see, see the wood of the cross, we see the suffering, we see outside the camp. And the thing I was wondering is what was saying, well, why would it be the, why, why would it be the involuntary or unintentional sin that would be the representation of, of the crucifixion of Christ? Why not the trespass offering, which is a sin of greater guilt? I don't know the answer, but I'll throw a possibility out here. A Acts chapter three. This is just just a thought. Why this? Why the, the lesser? Why the the offering that's associated with less guilt? In Acts chapter three, in verse thirteen, it says the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified His servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just. You asked a murder to be granted you. You killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Of course, Peter is saying this. And his name, through and through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you now see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know you did it in ignorance as did also your rulers. So think about that. When Jesus, when the Jews in Jerusalem killed Jesus, Peter says, he's not letting them off the hook. They killed an innocent man, but he says, you killed him in ignorance. You didn't realize what you were doing. You committed a terrible sin that you didn't know. You didn't understand the gravity of it. And perhaps that's why God chose the the this the offering for the sin that people didn't become aware of until later on as foreshadowing exactly how how jesus would how and where jesus would would come to a, a terrible end in the crucifixion and suffering outside the gate uh, so i want to close the lesson by by asking the question what's the significance for us here. In the scripture, I see a pattern over and over again where the same theme will show up in three different places. Okay, first of all, there's a prophecy about what's going to happen to the Christ. Then there's the fulfillment of the prophecy of what happens to the Christ. And then the third part is saying, guess what's going to happen to you if you want to follow Christ? The same thing as uh, number one and number two. You're, you're the ultimate, the second fulfillment of this prophecy. And here we talked about it in Hebrews 13. It says, Christ was the, the, we have the first example, the prophecy of the sin offering that was burned up outside the camp on the wood. Then we have the fulfillment of Jesus' crucifixion. And then it says, for us, what do we need to do? It says, you need to be prepared to suffer outside the camp so that you can enter into glory also this, this is the same pattern we talked about this in first peter the whole theme of first peter is the sufferings of christ and the glories that would follow in the, in the old testament prophecies we talk about the sufferings of christ and the glories that would follow then we have in the life of christ his sufferings and glories and then peter says guess what you should be expecting in life if you're following Jesus, it's going to be suffering now, and it's going to be glory to follow. The same thing, the same thing in Revelation chapter two, 
where Peter, where Jesus takes the, the, the wonderful statement in Psalm 2, it's a prophecy about himself, about how he would, he would uh, be, let's turn, let's turn there, I don't want to paraphrase, Revelation 2. So this is a pattern, pattern all over the scriptures. So this is where Jesus is quoting from in the book of Revelation and, and uh, his address to the church in Thyatira. He's quoting from Psalm 2, which applies to himself, and he's also he's applying it to us. Jesus says in, in verse 25, but hold fast to what you have till I come. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessels. As I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. So she is saying, okay, Psalm 2, it says that the Christ would rule with a rod of iron. So, and then Jesus fulfilled that. And then he's saying, if you overcome, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to rule with a rod of iron. And, uh, and you're going to be seated with me as well on, on the throne with me. Uh, he says, he who overcomes and keeps my work to the end, I'll give power over the nations. So this is the pattern in scripture, prophecy, Jesus fulfillment, and then us to follow. So uh, for, for good, the good parts and the hard parts, it's, it's all there. So, uh, as we look at these are not only the, the whole sacrificial system is not only foreshadowing Jesus and what he would do. It's also foreshadowing what God is calling us to do here. Let's go back to first Peter chapter two. As, as we mentioned, we're going through first Peter. This is a letter that's written primarily to Gentile Christians. First Peter 4, verse 3, it says, We spent enough of our past life doing the will of the Gentiles. And he's talking about the sins that they were involved in in the past. So he's writing it to Gentiles, but think about what he assumes that they're familiar with here. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are built, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In verse 9, he says, you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light so he's saying we are a royal priesthood we are a holy priesthood to put here to offer up spiritual sacrifices just as jesus offered up the sacrifice himself peter's saying this is what you need to do. And this is the foundation for everything that comes after this in 1 Peter. All the practical advice he's giving. You need to submit to the governing authority. Slaves, you need to submit to your masters. You need to treat each other with kindness. Husbands, you need to love your wives. Wives, you need to dress modestly. All these things are built on the foundation of we are priests of God who are offering sacrifices. And these are some of the kind of sacrifices. They're all kind, just like in the Old Testament, there are all kinds of sacrifices that we're offering. It's the same thing in Romans chapter, Romans chapter 12 and verse one. This is one of the great transition verses in the Bible. Let's turn there. So Paul does the exact same thing. First 11 chapters of Romans are dealing with this whole question of the Jews versus the Gentiles. You've got two groups of people. You've got the Jews who are following the law. You've got the Gentiles who are, who, who are completely outside the law. And what do you do with this? And first 11 chapters is talking about two groups of people. It's not talking about how do you, how do you get saved. It's not, it's not addressing evangelism. And so Paul concludes in... Romans chapter 11, with the parable of the olive tree. He says, 
the Jews are like the cultivated olive tree, okay? And because they didn't have faith in Christ, the branches got broke off, but we Gentiles were the wild olive trees. And because we had faith, we got grafted in. We got grafted into the original tree, to the tree stump, through which all the nourishing sap is coming through. Okay, so they got broken off because of unbelief. We got broken in. So we're all unified. We are connected to the original root of the, the, the faith of the, the faith of the spiritual forefathers. And so, so what of that? So in, in Romans chapter 12, in verse 1, he says, I beseech you, after concluding that whole argument from the first 11 chapters, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then the rest of Romans, all the practical advice that follows about how we're supposed to love each other, how we're supposed to treat each other, how we're supposed to submit to the governing authorities, loving our neighbors, living holy lives. All these things are coming out of the idea that we are the continuation of the original faith of God, the original, the, the original, the original system that God created. We're the extension of it. We're the fulfillment of that. And now we have to offer our bodies as living sacrifice. You know, a, a Jewish boy who's growing up in the first century if his imagine his father said to him what do you want to be when you grow up do you want to be a carpenter do you want to be a uh, do you want to be a mason do you want to uh be a be a shepherd and chase, watch the sheep and he says you know i'd really like to be a priest and uh you know they, they wear the really nice robes and they get a lot of attention and and everybody looks up to them i want to be a priest when i grow up and the father shakes his head and says i'm sorry son but you're born to the wrong father you can't become a priest. I'm not a Levite. Or he, or he says, I'm a Levite, but I'm, I'm from the wrong branch of the family. You can't become a priest because you have to be descended from Aaron. And, and, and we're not. You're out of luck. You can't ever become a priest. But the, 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 the wonderful news is that the priesthood has been opened up not only to all people of all nations. You don't even have to be Jewish but it's open up to women too. He says, we're all members of a royal priesthood. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean, uh, priest, does that mean we just sit around and wear nice clothes? No, priests have a job to do. Priests have a job. There's a job description that goes along with being a priest and it hasn't changed very much, okay? What is the job of a priest? I can think of two things. Number one, you offer sacrifices that are acceptable to God on behalf of yourself and all the people. That's not job one. Job two is you offer prayers on behalf of the people. All those who are following Christ, the high priest, you are now members of a royal priesthood. Guess what your job is? If you want to know what your job is, you look, you look in the scriptures. It's here. It's very clear. We are to be offering our bodies as living sacrifices. And we look at all the different types of sacrifices that there were in the Old Testament. And when I think of that, the peace offering, the offering of reconciliation, evangelizing, sharing our faith and reconciling people to God. That's part of our ministry. Being peacemakers and helping to unify Christians who are disunified. That's part of our ministry of being the peace offering of being willing to suffer at the hands of, of, of maltreatment and abuse, like Jesus, who was, whose body was burned outside the camp. We look at all these different sacrifices of giving to the poor, of sacrificing of our substance and our wealth and our comfort to meet the needs of other people, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to sacrifice of our own flesh, like the burnt offering that was completely burned up. The whole body was toast, okay? of saying no to the flesh, to saying no to immorality and internet pornography and, and all the desires, the, all the lusts of the flesh, the saying no to that. That's what we're here for. That's the job description of a Christian. We are to be a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people offering 
sacrifices acceptable to God. So I'll stop there for today. Amen.